your screen, you may have this one first, and but whatever it is, you want that option. And then if you just get the enter key, uh, you'll, you'll know you've accomplished it because eventually you'll get this big blue screen. And uh, in a short period of time, from there, uh, you will get a green screen with the Microsoft logo in the middle of it. it this screen takes a while. Uh, let me talk for a bit while it's, while it's doing this. Uh, Windows NT is a is memory dependent. The more memory you have, the faster it runs. The less memory you have, the slower it runs. It will not run efficiently at all with less than 32 megs of memory in a machine. Um, and the difference, and I can speak from first-hand experience here, the difference between 32 and 64 megs of, of RAM is almost a factor of two and a half times the speed. It's that much quicker. So if you're going to put NT on a machine, don't do it with less than, don't do it at all with less than 32. And if you can afford 64, put 64 megs. We're going to retrofit all these desktops to NT. These machines all have NT. No, I mean the campus. I don't know. Now, well, the reason I'm going to do NT is because the difference between NT and Windows 95 is infinitesimal. So if you had, don't have any N N 95 experience, what, what you get today will teach you 95 also. The difference between what you're going to see today and what we do with Windows, which is the straight Windows, is cosmetic. There's no difference. Mm -hmm. It's just how you go find things. Now, you will eventually get to a screen that says this. And if you are a, a DOS computer user, you know that when all else fails, you can hit Control, Alt, Delete, and Reboot the machine. You're scared to death when you get here, and it's not a problem. All you do when you hit here is just hold down the Control key, hold down the Alt key, tap the Delete key, and let go. And I think you'll get a message that looks like this on the screen. Mm -hmm. uh, if you do, you can just hit the Enter key at this point, and then you'll get to a screen that looks like that. Now, if you, you know, on each of the tables, there's a rodent. That's the mouse. And you should see that the cursor is sitting right in the corner of that box right now for username. Everybody's username here is the same. It is lowercase student730 with no spaces. S-T-U-D-E-N-T-730 with no spaces. And you can't hit the enter key at this point because if you do, it'll try to log in and you can't do that. So you have to hit the tab key or use the mouse to get down where it says password. And then you type the word student, S-T-U-D-E-N-T. Uh, Mr. Teacher, so. Yes, sir. This is a 16 meg. Yes, it is. It's 16 and it's very... Did you say to press Windows NT at 16 is terribly slow. What? Did you say to press N tab? The tab will do it. Don't press it. Yes, it will. Go to the arrow. Student. S-T-U-D-E-N-T. And when you type it, it'll be funny looking letters. It'll look like asterisks. But that's okay. Did you put the numbers after student up above? Yes. Just don't put the numbers on. Once you have... Student 730 here, and type the word student there, and it should say TNCC here, and you shouldn't have to change that. You can hit the enter key. When you do that, it should say something about logging you on, or it may not say anything at all, depending on how they have them configured. But it'll wink and blink, and this is going to take a while also. Not as long as the first one, but it'll take a bit of time. When Windows NT is working, the cursor gets a little hourglass next to it saying, I'm working, I'm working. And your screen may not come up looking exactly like this, but it should be close. I have two profiles. Ah, Troublemaker. See the icon for students here in Okay. He was just now, you, you may have you may have Thomas Nelson in the middle of the screen. That's wallpaper that somebody's put in there. Uh, you may not, but you should have. A group of icons. This is called this is called the desktop. There are a series of icons on the desktop, and this is all configurable. You can do anything you want. Uh, the start button down the bottom really is, in fact, where we start. If you push that little button, up will pop a menu, which is a list of things that you have available to you, from the programs to documents to settings to find and help to shut it back down again. When we, when we turn this thing off, we actually go to shut down and shut down. But, um, and if you're ever here and you want to get out of here, just press the escape key. The escape key is always the way to undo what you just did. Um, these machines all have Windows, uh, excuse me, Microsoft Office for 95, which is version 7 loaded. And I, I would guess on each of your machines someplace, do you have a little bar that looks like the one I got up here in this mm -hmm. corner that has a bunch of little icons on it? Mm -hmm. If you put the cursor over top of those, you'll see that that little words pop down to tell you what they are. 
And that's one of the nice features of this is that it, it does provide some help to you. In other words, this is what Apple's been doing for years. Yes, absolutely. Yes, sir. It's not going to back at home. Yes, sir. Is this computer making you having an allergic reaction? No, 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 no. It's the road. It does get silly. I'm out of the state. I'm out of my life. Yeah, start over? Yeah, I'd love to. Well, do whatever I just did. Okay, now, the one that has a little X on it is the one that's what we're about this time, and we're going to go there. So if you'll just push that little button, um, you should get a screen that says, loading Microsoft Excel version 7 for 95, and pop, up comes Excel. If, if you get behind or it doesn't work, please holler at me because I can't see your machines. I just went right into the spreadsheet. It should go, it should, well, let me mm. get this off the grid. Yours, yours probably goes into, like, like that. You may not see that first sheet. Okay, we there? Now, this is a, this is a, this is very busy. And let me explain what I mean by busy. First of all, the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to load a file in everybody's machine, which is sort of the outline of what we're going to do today. Um, if you will go up and click on that little folder up here on that bar. It looks like a little open folder. It says open. If you click on it, you will get a dialog box. Uh, that dialog box is... To, to, to get rid of the Microsoft Excel uh, one of those press. You don't want to get rid of it. You don't get rid of it. She's got the intro. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The intro sheet. Just click on the X in the corner. That X right there. There you go. Now, I think these are all going to come open to the same place in a folder called personal. Did they not? Now, we could try to rummage through all the stuff on this system and open a file. And for those of you who have been around for a long time and are old time computer users, that's what we used to do. You'd load, you'd load an application like Excel and then you'd go hunt for your file. Well, the current operating system is a much easier way to do that. So having done that and seen that it worked, I'm going to cancel this. And now I want to explain how you shut Excel. Up in the way up in the upper right hand corner, there's a little button that has an X on it. Way up in the corner. Click it. Upper right hand corner. Way up in the upper right hand corner. Far right up. Right. Probably need to get rid of the Yeah, to get rid of the cancel, say cancel, and then click on that button and it will close. Okay. Now, each one of you, each one of you should have somewhere on the desktop a thing which, uh, I'll put this one down here in the middle so you can see it. It's, it's a, it looks like a little drive with a bar underneath of it that says shortcut to student 730 on PMCC BLK dot, and it says H underneath of it. All that may not be visible on your machine because it may have dots in it look like that. But if you click on it, you should see the whole thing. Can you find it? Yeah. All right. Double click that and open it up. Now that should look something like Windows looks for those of you who are familiar with Windows 3.1. It looks like a window and it has in it, in this case, folders. On that list there should be one that says ABC underscore OR95 and it has an X in the letter. This is a document that is a Microsoft Excel document. You know it's Excel because it has the Excel symbol in it. And we don't have to open the application first. All I've got to do is click on that and it will in fact open. Now you have to double click. You have to click the mouse twice. But if you do that, it should open. Now, if it won't open, it says it's already in use. Do you want to make a copy of it? Say yes. Uh, says five reservations. <laughs> it says it can't access it. Okay. Say read it. It says read only, does it not? No, just, yeah, it says read only. Okay, just try it again. Um, do this again. Close this. If two people try to do it at exactly the same time, that's what happens. Just take it where it says read only, that's fine. Just click where it says read only. This is sort of the outline for today's presentation. We're going to go through about seven or eight sheets of this. By the time you get done, if you take this worksheet with you or you come by my office and get it, you will be able to develop your schedule for the spring and on the fly get an estimate of your part-time adjunct budget. If pay rates change, you can upgrade the pay rates. But I, I want to go through it step by step if I can. 
We all there? Okay. Uh, this is my kind of computer humor. When we talk about a window, and you're welcome to do this with me. If, 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 you, if, it, if you lose it, don't worry. We can get it back. It's not a problem. Uh, when we talk about a window, up here in this corner, there are three buttons. We know the one on the right closes the application. We don't want to do that. The one on the left looks like a little minus sign or an underscore character. If you click on that, the whole thing goes away. And you say, my god, where did it go? Well, if you look down the bottom of the screen on this bar at the bottom, you will see that there's Microsoft Excel. And if I click on that, it pops back up again. That button is called the minimize button, which means I couldn't have multiple applications open at a time. I can be working in three or four things and pop one of them up, pop one of them down. If I don't want to operate this thing full screen, if I want to see two applications at the same time, then I press the button in the middle. And the button in the middle takes that application, puts it in the window, so now I can see the stuff behind it. You're going to find when you're working in Excel, because of the size of the window that you have to work with and the resolution, it's probably easier for you to maximize it, which means you click that middle button again, and it pops it back up and makes it full screen. And that is, that we've looked at window, we've looked at the minimize button, the maximize button, and the close button. So we've done these four items. Every one of the applications that we use in the Microsoft area is in fact fairly standard in that it has at the top a menu bar. That menu bar, you can click on any one of those words and you can pop down a list of things that are there. With time, you'll learn what they are. Okay, if you have one of those down, you want to get rid of it, you tap the escape key a couple of times and it goes away. The things that we do most, the things, the operations that we do most, and the, the, the uh, activities that we do most often, they put on what they call a toolbar, which is right underneath the menu bar. And if you put the cursor over top of any one of those items, you will see that it tells you what that does. Again, in time, you will learn what they do. Um, one that is very useful, and most folks um, fight with the computer and don't understand this, is if you see this little box out here, this little white box, it says, mine says 80%. I think I've configured all yours to say. So suppose you happen to be um, visually challenged, and you can't see that screen. And you say, I need to make it bigger. Well, all you got to do is put the cursor in that box and sort of highlight the whole entry. And let's say we want to make it bigger, so I go to 150% and I hit enter. Oops, I, I go to 150 and hit enter, and it blows the whole thing. Now I can't see as much space, but I can blow it up. And uh, I'm going to put it back at 80%. I can pick one of the preset ones. There's at 75%. Um, that allows me to see more stuff on the screen and display more. But if you needed to zero in on the cell, you just increase the percentage. When, uh, because in this one you have 25, 50, 75, did you enter the keys? All I did was, was highlight the thing and type in what I wanted it to be. There, there should also be an entry on there that says select. Selection. Yeah, you can, the selection, you can click that and you can pick whatever you want. And you can actually just highlight the area and pick whatever you want. You gave me 400. 400? Yes. If, if you just highlight the whole thing, if you just go in here, if you just go in here and click on the 75 and type whatever you want, type 85, hit enter, it will put it at 85%. Okay. There you go. Now, one other item for you if you happen to be using Excel for the first time is that there are a tremendous number of shortcuts. No. Efficiencies that can be gained from using this thing. And most of us don't, I, I, I think I probably know 25% of them. And I've been using it for a long time. So if you'll notice out here, there's a little yellow light bulb. Well, if it's yellow, it means that, that there's a tip that it could give you that would help. And if you click it, you'll get a little window in the middle of the screen that says, okay, this is the tip of the day. Well, I don't particularly care about the tip of the day. So I click the light bulb again, and you notice it's, it's, it's a white light bulb. Anytime that we're working today, if that light bulb turns to yellow, something we've done could be done more efficiently, and all we've got to do is click the light bulb, and it'll tell us how we've done that. It's a nice little way to learn the shortcuts in Excel. All of the Microsoft applications have that stuff in them. Would you like to do this? Yes. That's on page. Let me turn a couple of them on in case people come in. And, uh, you're you're, you're going to be stuck in the front row. Okay. Down. How do you get rid of the box? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Back, sure. Absolutely. Absolutely.
I'd be happy to. Bob, how do you get rid of your tip line? Click on I just click on the light bulb again. I'll click on the light bulb again. And it goes away. I'll click on the middle button. I think it has. Okay. Is that supposed to be that big? That's fine. Okay. That's fine. That's fine. Hold that. Fix it. Hold down. <coughs> Are you maxing? And now you see. Okay. No, we'll get there. It just takes a while. Nothing. Okay. Um, if I'm going to move down on the page just a little bit so that I can highlight the next set of things. The menu bar we talked about, the toolbar we've talked about, now there are two toolbars that we're showing here. One is called standard and the other one is the formatting. We're going to get practice with both of those toolbars. Um, the formula bar will be useful when we actually start entering formulas and that's the third one down. The status bar is the bar all the way at the bottom of the screen. And those are the four things that you'll hear talked about. You'll hear talked about the menu bar, you'll hear the toolbars, you'll hear the formula bar, the status bar at the bottom of the screen. The only thing I know the status bar is useful for is to let you know whether you're ready. And if you see these little box over here, if you press like the num lock on the computer, you'll get a little thing over here that says the num lock is on. If you happen to have turned the cat lock on, then you get a little thing that says the cat lock is on. So it tells you the status of those keys, and that's probably at this point its only function for you. Okay, now. If I go down a little bit further, um, when you loaded this document, it is now called a workbook. It is not called a file. The workbook is comprised of several worksheets, and the worksheets each have tabs on them. And we're going to go through each one of those worksheets, and I could have renamed those tabs, but I didn't. Now, that's no change over the Windows version of Excel. As a matter of fact, if I were to take a Windows 95 version of worksheet, I could load it into the Windows 3.1 version 5 just fine take them back and forth. You cannot take the Windows 97 NT version. This is not the Windows 97 version of Excel, but you can't use that one. Just save it and read it backwards. Um, you have to save it in another format. I ran into problems last week. I was all prepared to work and realized that the file I saved was in the wrong format. I had to go all the way home and get the one in the right format. To come back. Um, the, the worksheet is comprised of, of a set of rows. Now, you don't have to do what I'm about to do, but the rows start at row number one. And they go, in case you're interested, to row 16,384. And I defy you to fill one of these up. Okay? Um, if you're interested, they, the rows, I mean the collars, start at column A and go to Drug Users Paradise, which is IV. Um, so actually, if I want the, the upper left hand corner of the worksheet is cell A1. The lower right hand corner of the worksheet is cell, oh, excuse me, let me is cell IV. If I can just get there. Okay. Is, is cell IV 16,384. And we could put data in every one of those cells. If you ever get lost in this thing and you need to find the upper, most of us start in the upper left hand corner. And you get down in this thing and you say, how do I get back there? If you hold the control key down and tap the home key from wherever you are, control key and home key, you will jump immediately back to cell A1. You can use the page down keys to page down. Now, I put a little area out here called the play area. And if, I think if you will put the cursor in any, any place but inside that play area, in any cell, and tap a key, you should get a message that say the cells are locked. Now, I've, I've protected this worksheet so that you guys can't fiddle with what I've written. But if you, if you go inside of that work area, you can put stuff in there and hit enter, and you'll put entries in Excel. Which is one of the nice things about Excel. If you have some data that you don't want anybody to monkey with, you protect the sheet so they can't monkey with it. Now, uh, if I can, I'd like to at least demonstrate uh, one thing before we move on. And uh, that is that if I put in alpha characters, if I put in, you know, like text fields, Excel aligns those text fields to the left. If I put in a number, Excel aligns those text fields to the right, as if you would have said numbers. 
So it's very important we have a set of numbers that you control the number of decimal places that you have so that the decimal points all line up. Uh, if you don't, Excel will just put the numbers in the way you meant them. Right. Um, we can talk about I want the number to align left. We, we're going to do alignment in a moment. We are going to do alignment in a moment. This is just entry at this point. You can put in there and enter stuff. You can enter anything you want, hit the enter key, and it'll take it. And this defaults to jumping down. So that after you've entered and put an entry in the cell, it'll jump down. Now, interestingly enough, if I go back over the cell, notice the one that's here also shows up here as being the entry in cell G19. I could edit the entry here, or I could edit the entry up here. I can actually go up on that formula bar, go in there, and say I want that number to be 13, hit enter, and the number became 13. So I can edit up here, or I can edit it down here. This formula bar will always show the contents of the current cell. The current cell being the combination of sum, column, and row. Um, the current cell is listed right there on the formula bar. In this case, it's G20 or I. We can, in fact, select a single cell, or we can select a range of cells by holding down the left mouse button and drag the mouse down. Now, that's the, dra the dragging operation is the, is the toughest operation that we have. But if you want to highlight a whole bunch of cells, put the cursor in the first one, drag the cursor down and let go of it, holding the left mouse button down while you do it, and, and it will highlight them. There are lots of times when we want to format a range of cells, we want to do some things with a range of cells, and that's how we do that. All right, now, one other thing that I want to show you, which, before we move on, which is really a, a, a function of Excel. Uh, let's suppose, and let me delete all the stuff that's in here so that you can see. Let's suppose that I want to put a set of numbers, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, vertically. Well, and there are several ways to do this. I'm going to try to make this as easy as I can. I'm going to type in a 1 and hit enter and hit a 2 and hit enter, excuse me, type in a 2 and hit enter. So I have the 1 and the 2 vertically on the page like that. And then I'm going to highlight both those two cells. And in the lower corner of the lowest of the right hand, the lower right hand corner of the, of the lowest cell, there looks like a little black square. If you put the cursor right on that little black square, the cursor changes from that big square to a little tiny uh, crosshair. And if I pull that down, once I've got that, if I pull the left mouse button down, pull it down, and then let go, I get one, two, three, four, five, six. So I could actually go that numerically. I could go as long as I wanted. And it, it assumes that I want to just increase. I, won't, I can't do it alphabetically, but I can do it that way. We can do it with days of the week. We can do it with months of the year if we want to. People will understand that. OK. That's sort of the guts of the first one. Notice at this point, on, at least on mine, my little yellow light bulb is on. <laughs> well, I just clicked the little light bulb that says, to increment a single number, help hold down control while you drag the, the the fill handle at the corner of the selection. So if I want to do that, it says here I can take a 1, put a 1 in there, hold down the control key, get the fill handle, drag it down, and I get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 for a single number instead of having to do 2. And there is a perfect example where we can get more efficient with the stuff that we did. All right. Uh, let's move on. Go to sheet number 2. Sheet number two is about text. And I've shown you some examples over here, and I've given you an area to play in over here. Now, this is one where you could destroy the whole sheet if you want to. But uh, let's say we wanted to, uh, if you'll put the cursor right over the cell that says bold underneath of where you can play. Uh, up, up, on the, up on this formatting toolbar, which is the second one down, uh, you'll notice that one of the buttons looks like it's depressed, and it happens to be the one that centers the text. And if you'll notice, the word bold is, in fact, centered. Um, there, is, there are three buttons, B, I, and the U, which stand for bold, underline, and under and, and italicized. So if you want something bold, basically just click it, and that turns bold. If you want to make it italicized, you click the I. If you want to click the underline, you click the U. If you want a combination, you can click any combination of these that you want. If you want it bold and italicized or bold and underlined, you can pick what you want. And these are nice for column headings when you've got headings and stuff like that that you want to work with. Can move. I'm, I'm going to keep going unless you tell me to go. All right. All right. If you hit the page down key, uh, and you may have to go a little bit further, this deals with fonts and point sizes. Now there is a default point or font shape and a default size built-in 
set into the options so that when you start this thing up and start typing in, it's going to put it in a certain size and shape. You can say, change the size and shape of any cell that you want, any range of cells, or a whole worksheet. Now, I'm going to take this cell out here that says different font, and in this little box up here, I've got, it says Arial, that is a font. If you click the right hand end of that on that little button, you will drop down a list. Now, you can only see a small portion of these. There's a huge list here. You can go down that list and you can pick any font on that worksheet that you want and, re and reformat that cell. Now, I'm going to go all the way to the end and I'm going to pick the one on the end, which is called wing names. And there's the word different font spelled in wing name. Uh, for those of you that would like to see what that is a little bit bigger, there's what it is at 20 points. And it's a bunch of fun little characters. Right? If you want to pick a different font, you go in and pick the font and and you can pick any one you want. Now let me, when I say this, let me offer a word of caution. Because here's what's going to happen. That's one of my favorites right here, so I, I use that. Um, you can change the size by just clicking on the size and going up here and saying, OK, I want the same font, but I want a different size. Uh, size is um, measured in 70 seconds of an inch. So 72 on that scale is one inch tall. 36 on that scale is a half inch tall. 18 is a quarter inch tall, and so forth. 9 is an eighth inch. Uh, and I think 8 is the smallest standard font that's available to you. You can go down and you can pick 8, and, and 8 is the smallest that you have for any given set. 8 to 72 should be the range. That's, 8 should be like a ninth of an inch. 72 is a full inch. Enough. So I can change the size of these things if I want. And that, again, becomes useful for trying to highlight something on a report or on a table someplace. Um, if you get down a little further, we talk about the alignment of the text. Now I put left, center, right, and across the column because we have four ways to align this stuff. If you put the cursor where it says left, and you click the button that says left, it shouldn't move, but it should now be aligned to the left. If you click center, and you go to the centering button, and click it, it should go to the center, click over the right, click the right hand button, it should go to the right. Those are fairly standard. Those make a lot of sense. I don't have a problem with those. Um, there are times that you want the text aligned to the, the left, times to the center, times to the right. Most of the time when we're working with data, we take the column headings, put them in the center, so that they're not out of line with the data. I mean, you have a, a label over here and data over here. It's tough to tell which label goes over which and make the column wider. Uh, and uh, across columns is neat. If I have a heading that goes across multiple columns, all I do is, in this case, I'm going to take that heading and I'm going to put it across uh, excuse me. If I can do this without going to jump too far. Right. Now, what I've done is I have highlighted three, co three columns column D, column E, column F with that label. And I click the fourth button over, which says center across columns. And what it does is it takes that label and centers it across the width of that thing. If I make them lighter, it centers them again. If I can drag column F out this way, and that label is still centered across those three columns. And again, that's very nice if you're trying to put a heading centered over top of the report. How, how did you move that block? Ah, how, how, did, how did I do what? How did you move where it says you can play here? I have it under column D. Uh-huh. Oh, oh, you just moved the app. All I did was put, put it in D and drag it, hold the left mouse button down and drag it out to F. Now, if you want to change the width of the columns, you put the cursor up between the two columns yeah. and you can drag like so change the column width any way you want. Hold down the left mouse button and drag it and set it wherever you want. One of the nice things about this is if you have a if, if you if you double click on a label on that column heading, it will adjust it to the width of the longest entry in that column. So if you have a if you have names and some of the names are short, some are long, and some of them are hidden and some are not, if you just go up and double click like right here, it will make the column as wide as it needs to fit that particular label. And it makes one to the left of it. Yes, sir. If I were trying to highlight, if I were trying to make column D, the, the, I would click right there, right at the right hand end of, of the D column. Yes, sir. Now I am on column B, but I want to go back to D. You want to go to D? Yes. How do I do? From B. Let me, can I come around and stand behind you? Please. This I can do. No, I just have to okay. Now just look, look at where you, look at where you are. You are in the 29th and 30th row, and you're way out in column double. The easiest way is to go all the way back to the beginning. Or, if you press the F5 key, now and say go to 
where I want to start with numbers, and, and I think you're probably sitting in cell F7, which is where I try to use the cursor. Uh, on the top of the main keyboard are numbers. And you can enter, I put 1.2345. You could, if you wanted to, type 1.2345. Hit enter, the number goes in, and it aligns over there. If you've never used a numeric keypad, on the right-hand side of the keypad, there are the numbers, but you have to turn the numbers lock on. If you have the numbers lock on, it says we're going to use this particular keypad as a set of numbers, and you can type 1.2345, and actually the keypad is much faster for entering numerical data. And I try to do everything I can when I work in database or spreadsheet, do everything I can in numbers, so I never have to go over on the other part of the keyboard. Anything I can put numerically, I will. You want to? I'd rather enter accounting as one and have a table someplace that says convert one to ACC than to have to type in ACC every time. First of all, I save two keystrokes. And all I got to do is remember that ACC is one, and ACQ is two, and, and business is three, and IST. And, and each of us have an area that we have to remember, but we don't have to remember all of them. How did you get that over that box? How did I do that? You have to remember all of this box. Oh, I, I just put the cursor over there. Everybody done with that part of it? Fairly straightforward. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Bear with me, we're almost there. Uh, if you hit the page down key, you move down to the next thing. Uh, is there anything else I want to say? Uh, is alignment? Oh, alignment. I'm sorry. Thank you, Mike. Uh, alignment of numbers. You can align numbers the same way you align text. So if I take this, two, this pair of cells, I can align them to the left, I can align them in the middle, or I can align them to the right. And as long as the number of decimal places is the same, it will align just fine. But what happens is, if I take the first number, and instead of being 1.2345, it's 1.23, and I enter it, now I have 1.23 and 1.2345, and I take those two numbers, and I align them in the center, and now they don't line up so they don't look like numbers, so they don't look like they can be added. Now, it's, it's an easy thing to control the decimal places of numerical data. Um, up on this bar, there are two little buttons. One of them looks like it moves the decimal point this way, one of them or add, reduces decimal places, one goes this way to add zeros, and I can, in fact, if I want to, I can decrease or increase the number of decimal places so that we have, in fact, got the same number of decimal places showing at any given time. You have to highlight the cell and then click on either one of those buttons. Once you get it to the point that you've reduced all the decimal places, trying to reduce it anymore, you get it, the machine beeps at you. Okay? If you make it bigger, if you make the number bigger and 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 bigger, and bigger eventually you will get to the point where you get uh, pound signs in all the cells. The pound signs mean there's an entry in the cell, but it's too wide to be visible with the cell width. So all I got to do is make that cell a little wider, and in fact, that number will be visible. That's how a spreadsheet does its thing. All right, if I move down on the page, I get to formatting. And, 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 and this is, you can take the standard format, but sometimes you want credit hours. If it beeps, do you need help? I'm in the... Uh Trying to decrease the number of decimals. And okay. Okay. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. Very efficient. Um, if you you have several ways to go about formatting numbers, numbers will come formatted in a particular way. The problem is when you're dealing with dollars and cents, like we're going to deal with, there are times that you want to display things as dollars and cents. The easiest way to do that, if I had a number, and I'm going to take a number over here, and I'm going to put 1,000 in that cell and hit enter. Now, when I do that, it says 1,000. And I happen to be optically challenged. And if you put 1,000 or 1,000, I can't tell the difference. So I got to do something with that, especially if that's money, so that I don't give the guy, you know, ten times as much change as I'm supposed to. Well, if you put the cursor right over top of it and you go up on the toolbar, you'll find that there's a little thing here that looks like it is probably going to format as dollars and cents. And if you click it, it will take that number one thousand and convert it to dollars and cents. 
and it puts the dollar sign way away from the number. This is an accounting format as opposed to a currency format. If I would change the currency, it would put the dollar sign right next to it. The problem with that is I can't tell whether it's a five or an eight. So it's very nice for me to have the dollar sign way out here. But it puts commas in, it puts two decimal places. I can take the decimal places out if I want to. I can do the same thing if I were to take a thousand and put it in the next cell down and enter it. Uh, and I'm actually going to put a thousand in three or four cells so that I can. Uh, I've got a thousand in three or four cells so I can put it in. You can do the same thing off the format menu by saying format cells, and you get this great big thing which is going to scare you to death. But one of them says I want to format it as accounting. And it shows you what it looks like. How many decimal places do you want to show? OK, I want it to show no decimal places. And now you have $1,000 without the decimal places. All right, now, one that I, I hate to say this. Gosh, I hate to say this. What, which I, did you choose in the format? I, I used accounting format. Accounting, okay. And I, and I turned it to zero decimal places. So that's two. Out of zero. Now, I'll show you this. This is one of those things that is, a, it, to me, I, it's absolute stupidity on my part that I didn't know this was there. There is a button up here. This little button looks like a uh, wallpaper brush on the top toolbar, about in the middle. It's called a format painter. And what it will do is if, when I click it, it will remember the format of that cell. And then I can highlight any number of cells I want, and it will put that format in those cells. And it will look like this. All I'm going to do is I'm, I got the cursor sitting in that cell. I'm going to click that button. The cursor now changes into a little a crosshair plus a painter. So I put it in the first cell that I want it to change, which is this one. Hold the left mouse button down, drag it, and let go, and everything changes all at once. So once I've got one cell formatted like that, I can format all at once. And I have to admit, I've been using the thing for about three years before I knew that. That's the kind of thing that comes up and you think, oh my god, why didn't I know this before? Mike, check. I'm sorry. Yeah, can we format a column with numerical format or date format? We can take an entire column if we want to by clicking up there. <laughs> or we can take a rank. Now, I don't want to do that because I got data underneath it here that I don't want to fiddle with. Or I can take a whole range of cells and say, OK, format that, format all those cells, and let's format it in currency format this time. And if it's a negative number, show it in parentheses and turn it in. So there's what it looks like, the currency format, unless I've messed up too bad. And I'm going to put a minus number in one of those places. I'm going to put minus 500 in one of those cells, and enter. And now what happens is I get minus 500 in that cell. No, no dollar sign, but it looks like a number and negative number show up in there. If, if you're working with negative numbers, that's a nice way to point out to you so you don't miss them. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. What I did to start with was I took a whole range of cells that I wanted to highlight, or that I wanted to format to highlight. Now I got to get to the format menu. Now one of the ways you can do one of the ways you can do it is off the format menu. Let's pull this down. Now I, I got to show you this for those of you who are a little further advanced. Every time that there's an entry on one of these menus, for instance, the one up here that says cells, right next to it, see that it says Control One. I'm going to get out of all of this menu stuff. So I'm right back at the screen again. I have those things highlighted. I'm going to hold down the control key, and I'm going to tap the one. And I get exactly the same thing on the screen that I would have gotten by going to the menus. And it's a whole lot faster for me when I'm on the keyboard to hit control one than it is to take the mouse and go up and pull that menu down. Get exactly the same thing. Now, I took number in this case, and I had a whole bunch of formats. Now, in this case, I took currency format. And I said, OK, how many decimal places do I want to display? I'll display two. And make all the negative numbers appear as red numbers in parentheses. And I picked that. And I said, OK. As soon as I did that, there we go. Now, if I put a number in any one of the other cells that I happened to format, I formatted other cells, but there was no number in them. If I put minus 2 in this cell and hit Enter, it will put it in as minus 2. OK, Gene? All right. Um, we've already dealt with controlling the decimal places. There are two ways to do that, one with the, the buttons up here and the other in the format. Next, next thing that you're going to have to work with is work with times and dates. Let's take dates first. Alicia? And uh, how is it that you darken the, um, the lines? What is it that you press? You mean the border around the outside? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Um, if you'll notice up here, up here, I have the sort of put a border around it. So what I do, I'm going to go over to another area on the worksheet. I'm going to go over here someplace. Okay. Let's say that I want to put a border all the way around those cells. Or, better yet, let's suppose I want to put a border all the way around those cells. One border around the whole thing. All I do is click that button now, move off those cells, and what do I have? Now, if I want to take it off of there, I go in here, I like that area, and say, OK, the border I want is no borders, which is the one in the upper left-hand corner. And now I get off of the border. Right. Let me go back over One of the things we have to work with is dates. Uh, this spreadsheet is very easy. If you have a date, for instance, I want to put in it. Set, this was supposed to be on 7.16, and today is 7.23. So if I want to put in 7.23, I found a numeric keypad. I have 7, uh, and then the slash 23 slash 97. Hit enter, and it goes in there. I can copy that date using that... Uh, Fill button, I can copy it all the way down there. So notice when I copied it though, it didn't copy the same date, it copied a series of dates. So I've got 23, 25, 26, 27. Don't worry about that. I, I just fill a different date. I can in fact change the format of the date. Now this one is month, day, year. If I hold down control one, I get this thing. It takes me to date because it assumes I got a date. Suppose I don't want the year, I just want the day and the month. For the month and the day. So I take the very first one, which is month and day, and say, just show me month and day, okay. And now that same day has changed to 726. But if you look up here, the entry in the cell is still 726, 1997. The only thing that shows, though, is the 726. And, and that probably is, is a point that I need to sort of jump up and down about in a spreadsheet. A spreadsheet, you have to answer, ask yourself two questions. What's the value that's stored in the cell, and what's the value that's displayed? I can store a value in there. In other words, I, I stored a date in there that's 7, 26, 97. But I only displayed 7, 26. Uh, I can display it so it puts the zero in the front of the month so that they all line up by doing exactly the same thing. Highlight that cell, hit Control in 1, and, and pick the next item down, which looks like 0, 3, 0, 4, say OK, and now it's 0, 7. I can make it say just month and year if I do Control 1, Come down here to where it says uh, month and year, March 95, boom, and I get July 97. I can make it say all the way out so that it's uh, July 16th, 97, which is if that's the way you wanted to do it. I can come down here and here's, here's that format. I just click OK, and now I have that format. There is, so far so good? There is a way to put the date and time in a cell. If you'll click on cell B43, you will see that the entry, it looks like what's in that cell. Let me get the cursor out of the way. It looks like what's in that cell is 7.2397 at 3.12 p.m. Well, it just so happens that according to the system clock, it is 7.23 at 3.12 p.m. as we stand right now. When it becomes 3.13, guess what this is going to do? It's going to change because what's in there is called a function. And the function is equals, and there are lots of functions. The one I used was now, open and close parentheses. So if I go to the, to the blank cell over here and I say equals now, open and close parentheses, and hit enter, what I get is a date and a time, and then I can format that if I want to. That's working with dates. Specifically working with dates, now I can work with times. Um, I want to enter 2 p.m. because I got a class that starts at 2 p.m. The easiest way to do that is go into cell, type in 14 colon 00 and hit enter. Now it went in as 1400. Now if I do that and I say control 1 to change the format and say, okay, put it as uh, a time with an a.m. or p.m., it will change it to 2 p.m. I don't have to type the a.m.s and p.m.s. I, I, my, one of the things I, I was about today was finding ways to save you guys keystrokes. I don't want to have to type 
type in 2 colon 0 0 p, pm. I'm going to type in whatever I can and have it do it. Now I can, I can format a whole range of cells and have it display any way I want to. Now these are the ways that I, that I saw that we might want. Again, I'm sorry. I'm sorry? Right again on the time to get I'd, from military to... I'd be happy to. I, I took a military time, okay? In this case, 14 colon 20. And enter it. Now when I did that, it says 1420. Now, if I put the cursor in that cell, two things. First of all, Excel looks at that entry and knows that it's a time. So when I do control one, it's going to take me to the time formats. So I go do control one and it dumps me to all the time formats. And these are all the formats I have available to me. Pick the one you want. Once you got one and you're comfortable with it, you got a whole range of these things, use the format painter and paint the whole screen. If I want to show it, I want it to show seconds, I can make it show minutes and seconds also. That's formatted time. Mostly ours is a matter of putting about putting in 8 colon 00 AM or 1 colon 00 PM. Uh, uh, the tough ones come when you have a class that starts at 7 and goes until 8 three days a week. People don't know whether it's 7 or 8 AM or PM, and you've got to put the AM or PM. Um, I think that's probably the bottom of that sheet. Um, terms of things to do. Yeah, that's the only Can I ask you a question yes, for a spreadsheet? Suppose, uh, for instance, we're trying to keep a, a spreadsheet on my accounts. I want the left column, column A, to be the date of an ex Just always, it'll be a date expenditure. Uh -huh. Can I format that column so that if I type 7 slash 9, it's going to always be it, it will, Excel is smart enough to know that when you type 7, 7 slash 9, that it is a date. Okay, it won't be 7 divided by 9. No, because in order to get 7 divided by 9, you have to say equals 7 divided by 9. Okay, it won't give a uh, computer time that's like 3 over 3 over 3. I don't believe so. If I type, if I type 7, 9, puts in, now, it's because I formatted that thing as, sure, okay? okay. Now, I could put the cursor in that cell. So, and, and notice I put in 79. What's really in that cell? Right. 7997. Right. It put the year on. So it's no need to format the column to recognize days. It does. No, sir. It does it automatically. Great. Thank you. Same with time. It recognizes time. You don't have to pre-format it. Now you may want to change the format so that you get it to show AM or PM or show the year or not show the year. Thanks. Right. Okay. Let's go to sheet number four. Now I've set it at 80 percent, so this whole area was visible. This sheet is a sheet that is protected so that you can't fiddle with it. If you'll go into the first little box, the one that says input a number here, and put in any number that you want. Uh, make it a reasonable number, but put any number in there you want. Now, when you hit enter, that number will be entered. And 45 plus nothing is still 45. And 45 minus nothing is still 45. And 45 times nothing is nothing. And 45 divided by nothing is a divided by zero. Occasionally, you will get a message on the computer that says pound divide by zero exclamation point. That means somehow you've got a formula that's got a zero in the denominator. Now, you put any other number in that other box, and all of a sudden, in my case, 45 plus 5 is 50, 45 minus 5 is 40, 45 times 5 is 225. 45 divided by 5 is 9. And I have formulas. All right, well, let's take them one at a time and see what they do. If you put the cursor in the box that says the sum, and you look up here at the formula bar, you'll see it says equals B5 plus B7. This is probably the, I, I don't want to get fancy. What it says for your purposes is take the entry in B5 and add it to the entry in B7 and put the answer here. Well, then the next one down is going to say, take the entry in B5, subtract the entry B7, and give me the answer here. The next one is going to say times, and the one behind it is going to say uh, uh, divided by. Times is the asterisk. Divided by is the slash. All of those things are on that numeric keypad. Everything that you need is over there. The plus, the minus, the multiplication, and the division are all over there along with the decimal point. So if you're working with numerical data, you can stay right on that pad and go like crazy. The one thing that's not there is the equal sign. 
So if I've got a formula and I want the equal sign, I'm going to press the equal sign over here and then go down to the formula. The formula is just that. It looks like an algebra formula if you think of this as x times y or whatever it happens to be. If you've done any computer programming, it's sort of laid out the same way. That, in fact, is a formula. Now, if you want to, you can play with them here. Uh, and I'll give you this workbook so you can do it. You can say, in this case, it would be equals d5 plus d7. And this would be d5 minus d7, d5 times d7, d5 divided by d7. And they'll all come up to be 0 or nothing to start with because you don't have any numbers up there. And as soon as you put numbers in there, it should work. And that, you have to hit the equal sign first, though. And these are such simple formulas that the easiest thing to do is just type them in there. So I would, in here, I would type equals d5 plus d7. There are other ways to get that in there. Yes, Mike? Is there a way to add a sum of range of cells? Yes. Yes, sir. That's a, that's a function, and we will get to that. Okay. I just did the first one, and it came up to be 0. If I put two numbers up here, uh, Two, three, two and three add up to five. So it, it works. And uh, you're going to get spreadsheets from, you know, if we start passing schedules around, you're going to get spreadsheets that have formulas in them, you start calculating pay, and that's something that you're going to want to handle. So there is a spreadsheet where we start to introduce the concept of a formula and how a formula works. I do not believe there's anything else on that sheet at all. I think that'd be that same. Uh, the next sheet is a sheet where I've introduced the concept of a function. The function is something that starts with equal sign, has a word in it, and there are a ton of built-in functions. Now, this one, I've, I've used them because we're, as, as the assistant division chairs, we're going to ask to do statistics along the way. I've created three statistical functions, the average, the sum, and standard deviation. And I've said, take these three numbers, calculate the average, add them up, and give me the standard deviation. You can go over inside that little box and change any one of those numbers. If you want, I can change any one I want. When I change the number, all these numbers change. If you look at what's in those cells, if you look in what's in D10, what's in D10 is equals average F8 colon F10. And you asked how do you get a range? That's how you do it, sir. If you want a, if you want a, a, a sum range, it's equals sum F8 colon F10. Now, the way that you enter functions in this program is dirt simple. There is a function wizard. A wizard is a step-by-step -step helping tool that allows you to do whatever it is that you want to do. Uh, my suggestion is if you get to the point that you need to work with functions, I'll, I'll do one right here on the screen for you, but if you get to the point where you want to work with functions, get somebody that's worked it before to take, it through, take you through it the first time. After you go through it the first time, there's nothing to it. Um, what I'm going to do for right now, I'm going to uh, you'll just bear with me. I'm going to unprotect this sheet. And I'm going to take out the average one. I'm just going to eliminate that cell completely so it's gone. And now I'm going to put it back in there again. Well, I go to the function wizard, and the function wizard, if for those of you who are mathematically inclined, it's the little button up here that looks like f of x. And I push that little button, and all of a sudden it says, hi, we're about to go through function. There are only two steps to this thing. You're on the first one. Now, it says here are some categories. Some categories of functions. Well, the function I want is a statistical function, and it's it's average. So I pick it. It says, okay, it looks like average, number one, number two. Okay, that's what it looks like. Let's go to the next step. It says, okay, it's going to average some numbers. What are the numbers that you want to average? Well, the numbers I want to average happen to be the numbers that are in those cells right there. So I put those three cells in there, and it says that what you're going to average is the numbers F8 through F10. It already gives me the answer right there. The numbers that it's adding up are 2, 10, and 6 because it's already told me what those numbers are. I say finish. Boom. There they are. I mean, it's that simple. Too. You can move one step by step by step by step. We asked for number 2. Is that another cell if, outside if, of the range? If what I were trying to do is I were trying to add a series of this cell plus this cell plus this cell plus this cell, I would put them in one of the kind of two ranges or have one of them. All right, well, here's what you came for, I think. Oh, excuse me, let me go back here. Um, the next function down was a, and this is a, this is a very useful function. It's the logical if. Now, all the entries are going to be made in this cell right here. Right now, there's no entry in there at all, and the entry right here says, please enter an M or an F. So I'm going to go into that cell, and I'm going to type an M. 
when I type it in, the answer over here changes to male. When I type an F, the entry in that cell changes to female. When I take the entry out of the cell, it says, okay, you got to enter something there. You want to enter an F. All that is done with a function, and if I, if I put the cursor back in that cell, it's all done with a function that says, if cell B28, which is this cell, is an M, and put male here, if it's equal to an F, put female there, and if it's neither of those, type presenter M or F. Again, it's a function you will, you know, they're easy to use once you've seen them, they're simple. Yes, sir. The place where this might come in handy, if you're doing adjunct faculty salaries, uh, if you put the rank in, you, you know, like rank two, rank three, rank four, rank five, you can say if rank is two, then $500 per credit hour. If three... We're going to do that with a lookup table. Just a minute. Just I, I, I did that on... Multi-meeting, you put an X in a column and it adds 0 0.5 to the credit hours to get the pay credits, just like that. Is it a part-time or a full-time faculty member? If it's a part-time faculty member, put an X in this box and it puts the pay rate in the other column. I mean, it, it, and it, it's all done. I'm really we're almost there. All right, we'll go down a little further. Uh, I've made a little table here to use to build a schedule. Now, this is only a piece of it. We're going to take this piece and put it with another piece in a minute. I've created a column which says number of semester hours. Is it a part-timer or a full-timer? What's the person's pay grade and level? Is this a multi-meeting class or not? Put in their pay grade and tell me how much I'm going to have to pay them and then give me a total for the whole thing. Now, if I take all of them, if I take all of the column, all the entries out of this part-time column, all the entries out of the level column, it tells me you don't own anything because you don't have any part-timers. So I'm going to say, okay, this one is taught by a part-timer, and uh, they're at level three. I'll take the multi-meeting out. As soon as I do that, level threes get paid $550 because it's a three credit course, three times $550 is $1,650, calculates the pay. If it were a multi-meeting class, all I got to do is put an X in that multi-meeting cell and it says you're not going to pay them for three, you're going to pay them for three and a half and it goes up to 19 .5. Now that's all done with functions. Uh, in this case, the pay rate is done with a lookup table um, and the lookup is done by putting Oh, it's on a different sheet. I'm sorry. I, I, I've got the table on a different sheet. Uh, right, right here I have the part-time faculty pay rates. And, and I think these are accurate. I got these from Nancy just a little bit ago. These are accurate. Ones, twos, threes, fours, and fives. And I had to put a zero in there, and they have to be in order to use the lookup function. But if I put in the grade of one, it will automatically go get 38. If I put in two, it will automatically go get 500. If I leave it blank, it will automatically go get zero. Do we have that screen in here too? Yes, you do. Yes, you do. We're about to go there. Oh. Okay. Um, if I if I tell it that somebody has a particular level four, it will automatically take the number of credit hours, multiply it by the pay rate. Go get the pay rate. It will go multiply the number of credit hours by the pay rate to give you the cost. This is a sum which is adding up the total. Now I built that into a spreadsheet, which includes the schedule. Uh, this, gets a bit this gets a bit cluttered, but bear with me. There's what I started with. There is the schedule for that we built for the, the business sort of courses for the spring. It has uh, accounting, uh, the, the department, the course number, the section number, how many semester hours, when it meets, what times it meets, who the teacher is, what room it's in, and if any notes that I, I might have to add to myself, I put in that column right there. Now, that's what label is wrong at the top. I apologize, but right. don't worry about this one. This is just for that was the schedule. And it's a fairly long schedule. Now, let me explain something. This is this is a very useful tool. I've got a very long schedule this way. Now if I go down the page, guess what I lose? I lose the headers. And 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 if it's a lot of columns this way and I move to the right, I lose the course. So the question is how do I make it so I don't do that? Well, if I hit the control and the home key and go back all the way to A1, cell A1, if you'll put the cursor in cell D2, put 
putting your cursor in cell D2, what I'm saying is that really is the first cell that I want to do. Everything on this side I want to lock, and everything above this I want to lock so it stays in place. If you pull down the window menu at the top of the screen and say freeze the panes, you will see that there, you get a, a, a line, a hard line that runs up here, and a hard line that runs across here. Now when I hit the page down key, I can hit it as many times as I want to, and I don't lose the headers. I can go as far to the right as I want to, and I don't lose the course names. If I hit Control and Home at this point, I will, oh, excuse me, I'm on. If I hit Control and Home at this point, I will go back to that cell D2, which is that upper corner. And I will always have these visible, and I'll always have those visible. I can get to them. I mean, it's easy to get to those cells and have to change something. But uh, uh, we have frozen this thing so that I will always have those, because these spreadsheets are too big to fit and see them vertically and horizontally. You can't get them all in there. All right. And so how did you get that bowl? Did you get that I'll do it again. Sure. No problem. Um, first of all, under the window menu, there's okay. a thing that says paint, something about paintings. Now, mine says unfreeze them because they are frozen. If I unfreeze them, <coughs> those lines go away. So I put the cursor where I want to freeze them. In this case, I put it at cell B2, because I want everything from in A, B, and C frozen. I want everything in row 1 frozen. I go to the window menu, I pull it down, say freeze the panes, and everything above that line and everything to the left of that line is now frozen, and I can move anywhere I want, and the last stuff is visible. Very useful when you're building a long schedule. Okay? Okay, one more sheet. Okay, now I've got to explain what it is. It's just a combination of two things, and, and, and bear with me. Uh, let, me, let me turn my protection off. I built a table. I built a table which counted the number of credit hours in accounting, the number of credit hours in acquisition, the credit hours in AST, the credit hours in business, in IST, in legal, in marketing, in real estate, and gave me a grand total. Boom. Got that. And, and that's not a very difficult table to construct. Then, I told it to give me, excuse me, I went in and I, in, and I wrote in here the number of full-time faculty that I had in each one of those areas. Then I tried to calculate how much, rele I put in here, how much release time we're going to have in each one of those areas. And in the spring, in IST, Sharon's going to have three, and I'm going to have six if all goes well. So we've got nine hours that we're going to lose. Which means that nine hours got to be taught by whom? Part-time. So I got to add it to the part-time budget. I took the number of part-time credits that I got out of this total of 53, how, much are, how, many, how many are being going to be taught by part-time, and I can do that very easily. If I got two full-time faculty members, they're going to teach how many hours? 15 apiece, which is 30. 30 to, subtracted from 53 gives me 23. And there should be a formula in that cell which says, OK, Take the entry in C7, which is this entry. Take the number in D7, multiply it by 15, and, and add the entry that's in E7 and put the answer there. So this is the number of credit hours that are going to be taught by part-time faculty members. Then I pick the number, and we're all going to have to pick a number, which is what's going to be the average cost of a part-time dollar. From my experience, it's been somewhere just a little bit above a three because you have multi-meeting class. It's going to depend on the department. I mean, you may be hiring mostly grade twos. You may be hiring mostly threes, but you got some multi-meeting classes, so you're going to pay extra to those people. you got to come up with a ballpark figure. I picked $550. I said, if the average is $550, and i got to pay this many credits, this is what it's going to cost, and that's what the part-time payroll, payroll is going to cost in that department if everything makes it. Now, that table took me about five minutes to construct. Once it's constructed, the only thing that's going to change on it now, if we delete a course, then I've got to go back and fix these. If we add a course, I've got to go back and fix it. But I can do that by reconstructing this part of the table, and the rest of that will just work on its own. We can, I can do that for each one of you. And probably the easiest thing to do is to come over and sit down with you once you've got your schedule built. Do it one time, and once you've got it built, then it'll change sort of on the fly for you. Um, I put in the part-time faculty rates. These are the rates that we'll be using. And I put all that stuff together. I said, OK. I put all that stuff together on a sheet. 
And if you go out to the right, you got more sheets somewhere out there. We got some more. Uh, I think there's one more. It's nine. This one gets really cluttered, and I shrunk it. And you can see that there's a, there's a solid line here, and there's a solid line here, which meant I want those to be frozen. Uh, it's all the same information, but I've got in here information about grade, multi-meeting, rate, and salary. And I can work right from here, and I can say, okay, this first course is going to be taught by a part-timer. Uh, they're a grade two. It's a multi-meeting class. And it instantly puts in the amount of money that's going to be going to cost me part-time money for that particular course. The second course is going to be taught by a full-timer, so I don't need to do any of that. The third one's going to be taught by a part-timer. Okay, well, I'm going to put in an X, and, and there are three, and this one is a multi-meeting class, and uh, that's going to cost me that amount of money, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. And down at the bottom, it can add it all up. And you get a running total of your dollars. All of this is done with, all of this is done over here with, um, in, in this column, with a function called the VLOOKUP function. Um, it's a simple function to learn. Um, individually, one-on-one, -on -one, boom, you know, twice and you got it. Um, uh, the salary out here is done with a formula. It's got an if in it. It says, okay, well, if it's a multi-meeting, then we've got to do one thing. If it's not a multi-meeting, we've got to do something else. Um, you're welcome to this whole thing. I mean, take, take the whole file and put it on disk if you want to come get it. I got it on disk. You put it on your machine. All you have to do is erase the schedule, put yours in, and then you've got one works. I can work down the page, and all the headings stay in place. Uh, as I do it, I've got a running total at the bottom. How much my budget, how much it's going to cost me. Um, and just click on the next sheet out. Um, okay. um, <laughs> mine only have shows sheet seven. Um, if, if, okay, I can fix that for the page. Um, well, let me, let me do it up here so, so that I can, if, if you'll notice, over in this corner on the bottom of this thing, there are four little buttons, those are called navigate buttons. This one will allow you to see the next numbered sheet, so click on the one that clicks one to the right, and then click it again, and we'll click another one to the right, and eventually you should start to see sheets 9 and sheet 10 down at the bottom, and you can click on them. If you want to click all the way out to the end, Click the last button out, which takes you to the last sheet that's available in that workbook. And if you want to go back the other way, click the other two. Okay. Okay. I have my pretty thing in there. I see. Yes, Jen. I took the schedule. I took the schedule which I had created in another program and imported into this one. Um, um, the nursing folks asked me if we could talk about importing data. Uh, again, if you need to do that, if you're going to work only in Excel, then you don't need to worry about importing. If you need, if you're going to work in some other program and you need to export from that and you import to this one, and you have to talk about that. If that becomes a problem, keep talking. I'll walk you through. Can you now I have a technical question for you. Sure. Will a, um, the, this, this information, can you do it in a, in a computer that is a 456? 486. 486, yes, ma'am. No problem at all. Okay. You can do this in a 386. It would be a little slower, but it would work just fine. Mm -hmm. the, everything that we've done today is doable in, in Windows 3.1 environment in Excel because the Excel looks basically the same. It really is not any different. I want to have to get an Excel for 3.1 to do it. That's Excel version 5, which is the same version. So it is. Excel 5 is Excel 5 is Excel 5. It should look exactly the same. Now, there, is, there are older versions, but if you have Excel 5, when you first start it, if it says Excel version 5.0, then it really is the same version that's here. You should be able to ask Frank. And 97 has version 7. Now, that's if you're using version 7, be careful, because you'll save it at home, and you'll bring it here, and you'll go to load it, and it won't open. I don't have it here. I don't have it at home. Well, if you work at home, and you save something at home, and you bring it here, and try to stick it in the machine here, it won't load. What you have to do in that case is you have to say, file, I will do it from here, and you say, uh, excuse me, let me try, not try that one. File, uh, save as, 
And when you get save as, you get a big window and it says, okay, how do you want to save it? And down here you say, okay, I want to save it as a text file or as an Excel version 4 or as a, a Lotus file or a DBase file or a Quattro file or whatever you want to save it as. And then you save it. But you would have to then save it on that list to an Excel version 5 file, which is a different format. It would do it just fine. As a matter of fact, that's what I did here. This was made in version 97. And when I saved it, I saved it in the 95, three, version 5, version 95. That's good enough. Other questions that you might have for me? Could we get site license for this for from Frank to give to the people who have a 386? I'm not sure. Okay. When you get all done, you push the button to close it, and you back out to this screen. When you get to this particular screen, um, we, we, in shutting the Windows NT down, it, there's not much more, there are lots of things I could show you in here, uh, but I think that's, a, that's for another time. Uh, to shut this down, you push the little start button and click where it says shut down, and you'll get a message in the middle of the screen, you have three options. One is to shut it down, one is to restart it, and one is to log on to somebody new. To make sure the button is in the top one which says shut the computer down, and then you can click where it says yes. And it will wink and blink and it will close all that stuff and you'll get two messages. One says, please wait. And the other one says, oh, I get three. <laughs> Sorry. <coughs> the last one, this button that says, is now safe to turn the machine off. On the front of the machine, about halfway up, there are two buttons. One on the right hand side. If you push it, you can turn the machine off. Watch your eyes. That spreadsheet. Yeah, yes. Shut her monitor off. That's why I didn't assess my monitor. Did she get it? Okay. Oh, Thanks. Did you send me a copy of this? <laughs> <laughs> if you want to take a copy with you, you can take it with you. If you want me to bring you a copy, I'll do that. Okay? I'll walk you through that process, too. How much space do you have? To save the spreadsheet? Save. This, that worksheet? Oh, so we need to turn it back on. I can do them all on my machine. Oh, okay. I can do them on my machine. <laughs> Hi, and these okay, are the people that learn this stuff. Hi. Somehow, if I don't look at you, we'll jump back. <laughs> <laughs> you look good out there. This is only about 150. Oh, yeah. Huh? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You still got me? Yeah, yeah, I still get you. But I didn't use you. Okay. <laughs> You never know when it will pop up. Look at it. Somebody has a disc out here. I love the reaction. I'm going to use that one somewhere too. I'll bring it. I'll bring it.